England, from the very early stage, and this is, this is the work of the Cambridge School uh, of, of uh, family historians, seems to have had a structure of more or less a modern style nuclear family. Very, very small, relatively atomistic families. And of course, law itself becomes of fundamental importance in mediating between them. So what I'm suggesting is, which is obvious to everybody, that law and history and the people and consent are very, very closely related with each other. But ladies and gentlemen, it's not simply that I happen to have fallen off a plane this morning. It's not simply that we're here this evening talking about Potimos. We mustn't forget there's a little thing called a general election happening. It's very good of you all to turn out. And ladies and gentlemen, that general election, even seen from the distance of America over the last 10 days, is a very, very peculiar one. And what it is, I think, it's the first general election at which it's become evident to all sorts of people that something is radically and seriously wrong with our political culture. Not only with our political culture, but I would argue with all our institutions of state. When I was a boy, it was a very, very long time ago, it was a source of pride. We thought of the English Parliament as the mother of parliaments. We thought of English law and English justice, we use that word justice, as the best justice. We saw still the remains, if you like, of the great achievements of the Industrial Revolution. We had somehow the feeling of the English monarchy being a model just as the Westminster Parliament was. I would su suggest that all of that confidence is gone. We no longer think of English law, my lord, as the best. We no longer think of English justice as a model. We no longer think of the Westminster Parliament holding out our hand like a nursing mother to those lesser breeds without the law. What has happened? What has gone wrong? How might we begin to put it right? Because I do think, and I'm sorry, I'm adopting sort of slightly false solemn term. I was introduced as a wit. I decided, uh, like all clowns, you know, to reveal the tragedy behind the mask. Um, uh, but it does seem to me that if we don't recognize that something has gone wrong, we have no chance of putting it right. But that is, I think, the most important point that I want to make. And I think, again, as Lord Law said, History is not simply something dead. It is something, providing it's not uh, taught at GCSE in the fashion in which it is taught at GCSE, which is fecund, fertile, can refresh, can make you think again. The very best accounts of history, of course, are those of novelists. You mentioned the novel. Uh, the idea of time as another country, a past world as another country, where they do things differently, even occasionally do things as the same. But another country that forces a kind of tourism in time in which we should keep the open mind to be refreshed and to be rejuvenated as ideally a holiday can. Time tourism. So let's begin right at the beginning. If we go back to the sort of very origins of English law in the... Uh, in, in the uh, 12th and 13th century, some very striking features emerge and emerge very quickly. Uh, in the age of Henry II and Becket and Bracton, there is a very striking notion, and it's one I think that everybody in this room, and remember an organization, the Inns of Court, that don't go back quite so far, but go back right deeply into our medieval roots. Um, already, by the very origins of English law, the beginning of written English law, the beginning, unless we uh, sort of uh, imagine the laws of Edward the Confessor actually exist, uh, the very beginning of English law, written law, there was already the sense that English law was three things. It was coherent. It was different. And within England, it was universal. Now, this is very remarkable. 
England, of course, was an important monarchy. Along with France, it was one of the only two monarchies of the Middle Ages uh, in which the full ritual of coronation, and the French, of course, have a much better word for coronation than we do, um, sacre, consecration of a monarch with holy oils. It was one of the only two monarchies that had this full grand ritual. It's one of the reasons, of course, that William the Conqueror, a mere duke, was so keen to get his hands on England. But England was not hugely important in the European context, nothing like, say, the German Empire. And yet, at this very early stage, England and English lawyers see themselves as an equivalent, equipolent, and rival system of law to Rome. This is the most remarkable thing about it. They consciously measure themselves against the achievements of Roman law and say that what we have done is produce something that is at least as good. Now, I think we've forgotten that, and I think it's time that we remembered it. And it's a very impressive thought, and it's a thought that suggests something very significant about our history. And again, one of the great problems is that you, you, you're talking about lawyers not always remembering their history. One of the great problems is historians increasingly have forgotten law and on the whole devote very little time to it, either as political historians or more particularly as social historians, despite the overwhelming importance of legal evidence. Now, this, subject, this, this sense of distinctness, this sense that English law can stand as an equal and rival to Roman, I think raises some very interesting questions. Because what I would like to suggest, and it's an enormous, daring, and probably rather silly generalization, but I do think that Roman and English law reflect two absolute fundamental distinctions in the way in which human organizations operate. It seems to me that there are really two different ways of doing things. One is the English, and one is the Roman, and all its derivatives. And it also corresponds very much to a logical position. Roman law is essentially deductive. It deduces from grand general principles. English law does, of course, no maxims, but essentially English law is inductive. It takes specific cases and builds up. Now, this seems to me to be perfectly clear from the very beginning, and it remains profoundly important. Now, this also has very fundamental, aspects, sorry, very fundamental consequences, I think, for notions of state formation as well. The, if you like, a deductive state, the characteristic Roman state, which, can I gently say, is still very much with us. France and the European Union are consciously constructed on a Roman model. In France, what happens, of course, is that you have really three bites of the cherry that produce this radically different set of things. It, 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 France seems to me, and England, it's a very nice remark, and I can't, yeah, you couldn't remember what Walter Scott actually said. Uh, I can't remember who said it. But the, the, the nice remark is that England and France are the missing halves of a perfect civilization. And if you could actually unite them. Uh, but as you know, uh, the Channel is by far the widest strip of water in the world, and it's rather like Alice in Wonderland. You reverse as you go across. Now, uh, the, the French have three three great moments of state formation. Colbert, which are also legal. Colbert, in the reign of Louis XIV, um, the great minister, uh, Napoleon and the Code Napoleon, and also the Fifth Republic. And they all do exactly the same thing. They create a state in which a parliament or a representative assembly or representative assemblies are seen as essentially consultative. They reflect to the doings of little people that the intelligent ruler must pay account, must take account of, but shouldn't pay too much attention to. On the other hand, power rests with an elite, which is an expert trained elite. Its latest manifestation is the ENAC. And of course, when the French refer to a bureaucracy, they do not mean what we mean by a civil service. 
That is to say, a group of experts ordered to do what they do, in theory at any rate, by politicians. They mean what the word bureaucracy literally means, which is a ruling class, a ruling elite. And the EU is very deliberately constructed to reflect that. The EU Commission, which we constantly refer to as poor, ignorant, foolish, suckered Brits, we constantly refer to as the European Civil Service, is not. It is the prime body of governance. It is the origin of almost all law. Similarly, the European Court operates as... I'm, here I'm really teaching my grandmother, but it operates essentially according to the principle of a key. In other words, there is a goal. There is a goal of European unity, and every single decision tends to that goal. And there is a constant process of accumulation towards it. Now, ladies and gentlemen, again, a notion like the public interest. The public interest in France does not mean what me, we mean by the public interest. The public interest in England is a product of a huge process of diverse disputing little people all competing and arguing with each other and finally an inspector, poor man, having to weigh all these little pieces of competition against each other. The public interest in France means what the elite perceives it to be. It is deductive, which is why, combined with <coughs> highly effective bribery, and very, large, um, and, and, and very large bulldozers, it's so easy to build a high-speed rail line in France and so quite extraordinarily difficult to do it in England. Unless we modify our planning system to the equivalent of theirs, which is now in active discussion. Now, this, I think, highlights some very important points. It seems to me that the Roman way and the English way do differ in some absolutely fundamental ways. Law in the Roman tradition is essentially the product of will. It is essentially the product of the sovereign will. Law in the English tradition, obviously there is will, there is the will of the sovereign, or latterly that pair there, the sovereign parliament, but two other elements seem to me to be extraordinarily powerful. One is the idea of consent, and the other is the idea of representation. And these ideas seem to me to be absolutely fundamental, and they are, of course, so intimately associated with that institution that we are electing today, or rather one member of which we are electing today, Parliament. It very quickly becomes developed in England that law is only of universal and binding authority if it is passed by Parliament. What is Parliament? What is this body that can bind everybody that whose consent is presumed, that the consent of everybody is presumed to everything that it does? And again, as early as the 14th century, the judges react to people claiming we can't possibly be bound by an act of parliament uh, because we weren't there, um, we, 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 uh, our little community wasn't represented or whatever. <clears throat> the judges have a perfect formula. It is that everybody is presumed to be represented, everybody in England is presumed to be represented in parliament either in person, that is the king, a peer, lay or ecclesiastical, or by his representative, that is if you're a countryman, it is a representative of your county MP, or if you're a townsman, by uh, your burgess uh, or your citizen who is the MP for, for your little community. And this idea is one of remarkable power. And it seems to me it is unique. You will find no other European legislative tradition that places this emphasis on representation and consent and also on participation. And I think that point about participation itself is also very important. Law to bind. And when, as I said, I was a young man, and we also said things that now again, nowadays again, seem rather strange, that the English are a naturally law-abiding people. Now, anybody who's looked at the number of his predecessors who uh, were murdered in various rather horrible circumstances know that that isn't strictly true, or the prevalence of riot 
urban riot, particularly London riot in the 18th century. On the other hand, it does seem to me that this notion of law as the possession of a people was powerfully ingrained in the English mind. And it seems to me that a law that does not seem to those who are subject to it to be their common possession, the thing that they have created, the thing that they have owned, is not a law that works. Again, one of the striking things, and it's, it's now much less clear than it was, but it certainly, uh, uh, in the 19th and early 20th century, it was very clear indeed. Why constantly, again, using this convenient dialogue of what goes on on the two sides of the channel, why are the English constantly accusing their bureaucrats and government of gold-plating European legislation? Why are we constantly saying um, that, okay, you know, the French and the Germans, well, possibly not the Germans who have got their own uh, sets of problems there, um, but the Italians and the Spanish, you know, are perfectly happy to, to, to assent to a law, and then what do they do? Well, they don't obey it, and they make absolutely sure that they don't obey it. Why do we have this attitude of, well, it is the law, therefore it must be obeyed to the letter? Well, obviously, the element of letter is precisely the point that I've been making, the inductive notion of law. Therefore, the literal meaning, the literal verbal meaning of law is quite extraordinarily important in the English tradition as, a, as opposed to the much floppier uh, Roman tradition. But I think it goes beyond that. Because of the idea of parliament, uh, because of the idea of consent and representation, law is still, and 50, 100 years ago, was much more powerfully felt to be something that you had actually shared in the making of. It was part of you, and therefore you were morally obliged to obey it. Now, if you're Irish and see law as an English imposition, if you're Italian and see law as something that the Austrians shoved upon you, you don't think like that. If in Greece, remember, well, we, you know, Greece is a rather interesting test case too. Remember, Greece, this, all this nonsense about the cradle of democracy and whatever. Uh, Gre Greece is a rebellious province of the Ottoman Empire. And it's entirely incomprehensible what is going on there against any other. You know, history really is, on the whole, I think the Greeks are just, uh, uh, you know, Ottomans that happen to go uh, orthodox. But there we are. Um, uh, which, is, which, of course, is why their food is identical. Um, <coughs> and, uh, but, but obviously, See, you see law, you see what I mean? You see law as something completely different. Again, uh, in, in some colonies, uh, law again seen as utterly opposite and different. And one of the marvelous things about India is that India seems, on the other hand, Hong Kong seemed to be seeing a law that was essentially an English or a British law as increasingly part of themselves and defining themselves. So this idea of consent of representation is utterly fundamental. I think it also goes along with something else. It, and and th therefore, of course, uh, our sense of the possession of law weakens as we feel that Parliament itself is less effective and less, 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 less representative and so on. But it also goes along with something else. If one looks in the, 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 the two different traditions, the English and the Roman, it's not simply the machinery of making law uh, that's different or popular attitudes towards it. It's different. It is actually the nature of legal process itself, which is quite radically different. Um, and let's look at two extremely important areas, law enforcement and the actual judicial process itself. If one looks in the Roman law tradition, normally law is enforced by a quasi-military body directly uh, uh, answerable to the, to, to, to the central state, to usually <coughs> the imperial authority. And uh, the gendarme, uh, the gendarme, what is a gendarme? A gendarme was the original standing army, of, a member of the original standing army of the French kings. It is um, a quasi-military or very often wholly military. Again, one looks in Italy, one looks in all of these countries. There are highly militarized police forces, which from the beginning were always armed. England, of course, <coughs> has a very different tradition. Uh, another 
great member of, of one of the inns of court, I think it's Lincoln's inn, isn't it, Sir John Fortescue, uh, in the governance of England, boasts that an essential guarantor of English freedom is English lawlessness, taking a very different line uh, from the one that I'm doing. And, and, and indeed, for much of the period, the very weakness of English law enforcement with, with the petty constable and so on, um, uh, who is always a local bod, usually a rather retarded local bod. If you, if you look at the, uh, what well, times don't change really, do you? Uh, but if you actually look um, in Shakespeare, the law enforcement officer is invariably the buffoon and the fool, the bomb bailiff, uh, and, and, and all the rest of it. Um, uh, but by the time uh, that, that, that partly in uh, uh, the great movements within London and the London magistrature, and we'll talk about magistrature again uh, in the 18th century, and above all, <coughs> because of the, sorry, <coughs> planes do have. <coughs> consequences uh, <coughs> and, uh, the, uh, and partly because of course of the enormous growth uh, even beyond the 18th century of early 19th century London you get Peel and the creation of the Peelers and the police force but ladies and gentlemen that early police force was consciously designed to be ridiculous it was given a uniform that was as preposterous as it could possibly... There was a kind of national competition to make... You know, police constable's helmet was the most impractical object that anybody could devise and the furthest possible thing from what? Military dress. And the powers of a police constable, as again I needn't tell you, mostly are, as it were, derived from very, very ancient common law principles. They are not the result of a paramilitary organization drafted in from the center. Or, ladies and gentlemen, before Ian Blair, they didn't used to be. <laughs> and the militarization of our police, the conscious term, us civilians, the talk of civilian police officers, the creation of this mysterious ethos capped by that strange organization called APCO or whatever it is, um, all seems to me to be profoundly worrying and to be profoundly alien to the English tradition. And of course, much of the explanation for it is that great god, that, uh, uh, that, that god of Baal and Moloch security. That deadly, deadly thing. So, Traditionally then, the police, or the way law was administered, was very, very different in the two cultures. And of course, the way law is administered also in terms of the judge himself. The idea of a magistrate, the idea of a representative of a local community, admittedly, uh, until very recently, class determined, let, let us not, you know make any bones about this, but the, the, as, it, as it were, the, the, the local judge who is a representative of his community, lightly, uh, lightly advised by a professional lawyer, is again part of this sense of law, not simply as a possession, as a national possession, but law also as a local possession. And similarly, the dominant role of the jury in the English system is also part of this, and of course, originally, going vastly beyond what we have. Um, we just have what, in historical terms, is known as the petty jury. That's to say, the actual trial jury. Originally, an America, which of course has preserved so much more of this structure than we've done, in, uh, in America, you have the grand jury, um, which uh, originally found that there was a true indictment, in other words, an indictment that was worth pursuing, um, or uh, in the very earliest, in the earlier stages, was itself part of a process of investigation, uh, actually you know, presenting what crimes and so on had been committed um, in, 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 in the locality. So law then, at every level, uh, in terms of how it's enacted, how it's administered, how it's enforced, and, and how verdicts are arrived at is seen in this tradition as opposed to the Roman tradition as a common, even a popular uh, uh, possession. And this also has very, very important consequences in one or two other areas, particularly the method of trial. The preference of English law for fact the preference of English law for evidence uh, produces a very unusual system of justice. 
It does not depend on the use of torture. All Roman criminal law depends on the use of torture. One of the most truly shocking rooms in Europe is to be found in Salzburg. And we all go to Salzburg for exquisite Mozart festivals. And we admire the pretty little Baroque twiddles and the tiny squares and the sweet Austrian way that they have with the children and, and, and you know, gypsies and all the rest of it. Um, uh, 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 and Mozart's balls and so on. But ladies and gentlemen, can I suggest when you do go to the Mozart festival in Salzburg, you visit the bishop's castle. The bishop who is, of course, uh, the Prince Bishop, who is, of course, Mozart's first patron. And it's a very handsome castle, heavily refurbished uh, in the middle of the 18th century. So it's got lots of Rococo flourishes, complete with a Rococo torture chamber. Uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, we all think, and the tower, of course, illustrates this fact rather wonderfully, we all think of torture chambers as you know, dripping medieval vaults with huge hulking creatures. Uh, ra ra the, the whole thing vaguely said in masochistic and whatever, and done in the kind of decency of obscurity and, 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 and guttering torches and that kind of thing. Not a bit of it. Go to Salzburg. It's at the very top of the building. It has huge, elegant, neo-Gothic windows. Elegant pretty little twiddles. And then all the apparatus is still in position. All the various racks and instruments, which again have the sort of decoration that, you know, Liberace had on his candlestick on the piano. Again, little twiddles. And, you know, the Rococo is sort of slightly off, off, off key like that. And what's even better, ladies and gentlemen, is they still complete with the instructions. I imagine they came jolly useful in the last war. Um, and, and over each one of them, again, in a pretty little Rococo frame, you know, you've got suspect with clothes on, suspects with clothes off, arm in position one, two, three, wrench, torn out, broken. That is numbered. The French for torture is la question, the question. And in pre, uh, pre, immediately before the, right up to the revolution, the way in which examining, what the examining magistrate was, was the magistrate who examined you whilst you were under torture. And at each stage of the legal process, he made a notation in the margin, one, two, or three. The normal torture was la botte, and that was simply a fixed plank and a mobile plank and three wedges. One was one wedge, painful, a bit bruising, not too bad, you know, uh, uh, gets, gets the soft lads, you know, duff people up. Two, three, smashes the lower leg. And it was done in every case for a non-noble. Now, we may reflect on this as modern squeamishness. After all, uh, the English uh, were not exactly backwards at coming forwards when it came to penalties. Mm -hmm. You know, hanging, drawing, and quartering, which we all sort of, it trips off the tongue rather nicely, doesn't it? Um, there's a very famous incident when um, uh, uh, the, um, the poor little Portuguese physician was framed uh, for having uh, um, uh, poisoned Elizabeth, and it was decided that there had to be some especially uh, exemplary uh, punishment inflicted on him. And in typical fashion, Burley, who really, I think, in some ways is, is much more a product of that expert tradition of government than us, goes to the physicians and says, can they come up with a peculiarly horrible method of execution? And the Royal College meets in solemn session and advises him, sir, my lord, Lord, I'm sorry, he's a peer by this time. My Lord, done properly, it is inconceivable to think of anything more painful than hanging, drawing, and quartering. So, but that is a penalty. That is after conviction. And what is quite striking is that the first serious, fundamental European attack within Europe on the use of torture is written by an English Secretary of State. It's John Smith in the De Republica Anglorum. And Smith knew what he was talking about. Because, of course, Smith um, was uh, Secretary of State in this brief period when the English do use tor torture is written by an English Secretary of State. It's John Smith in the De Republica Anglorum. And Smith knew what he was talking about. Because, of course, Smith um, was uh, Secretary of State in this brief period 
when the English do use torture frequently, we're in the, again, it's circumstances very similar to now. It's the ideological warfare of Protestant versus Catholic in the second half of the 16th century. And suddenly, the rules against torture are broken and honored more in the, in, in, in the breach or the breaches or whatever uh, than the observance. But nevertheless, Smith, the Secretary of State, again in charge of examination, had had to be present. And he resigns rather than continues. It seems to me to be one of the, and you will find absolutely no equivalent anywhere else. In other words, the origins of our notion of cruel and unusual punishment, the, 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 the notion of, 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 of the, treat, uh, the, the treatment of, 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 of those either under investigation or convicted is almost entirely within the tradition of English law. There is no equivalent to the prison reform movement in Europe. The, the sort of Elizabeth Fry kind of thing. There's no equivalent. There are campaigns to make them more hygienic. There are campaigns, uh, you know, to stop them uh, uh, breaking out and more disciplined and so on. But there is no equivalent of a humanitarian campaign. So, again, I, I hope I'm, I'm coming up with, 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 with some ideas that, that are really worth at least a moment's thought. And the final thought, uh, because it's time that we, we, we ought to leave a little, a little time for questions and discussions, as I've put some uh, big ideas with deeply inadequate evidence, not even with a, with a misremembered quote uh, to support them. Um, one of the other very striking things of English law, and I touched on this to begin with, is its jealousy, its sense of universality. Now, this may seem a rather less good thing. After all, the word jealous is, is often an ugly word for a very, very ugly thing. But right again, going back to Henry II, what is striking is the jealousy of English law, which is, of course, the basis of the most famous event of the reign of Henry II, the clash with Becket. Now, what essentially Henry was claiming was that everybody in England, of whatever status was subject to the king's law, was subject to the criminal law. What Beckett was claiming was special protected status for the church. And isn't it interesting how times, you know, the, 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 that wonderful phrase uh, uh, in, in Twelfth Night um, where the jester sings, and the, or rather the jester turns to uh, Malvolio, I, my lord, was a brilliant Malvolio when I was a schoolboy, um, uh, turns to Malvolio and says, thus the whirligig of time uh, brings his revenges. Well, the whirligig of time uh, has indeed brought its revenge with the child abuse scandal. Because, ladies and gentlemen, Becket is the patron saint of child abusers. The whole argument of the Roman Catholic Church for its special position, protected from the ordinary operations of law, is exactly what Becket was arguing. That is the struggle with Henry II. There's absolutely no doubt about it, whatever. And it's fascinating that we've all got terribly sympathetic and, oh, Beckett, you're his, his martyr, poor old churchman, wicked, wicked king putting his neck upon him. Doesn't it all look different in the course of the last you know, 18 months, uh, two years? And this jealousy, this jealousy of English law is, in other words, <clears throat> it's a jealousy for any rival system of law within. If you have a system of law that depends upon consent, an imported law cannot carry that consent. This is the key issue. And you see it emerging again. Usually, of course, it emerges with the church. Because what we must remember uh, is, again, the church law is, of course, pure Roman law with an absolute universal sovereign uh, and so on. Um, and, but it is also a, a separately taught. It's the only law taught at Oxford and Cambridge. Um, it colours the whole operations of the civil service of the most um, imperial-minded of the English kings, um, Edward I, um, uh, and, uh, and so on. Um, it, but, but it's it undoubtedly seen as a fundamental rival system of law. It also covers much more uh, than just what we might imagine, theology and so on, all forms of, testament, of, of, of testamentary bequest which do not involve real property depend on church law. All forms of contract, most forms of contract, depend on church law because, of course, the contract is sealed by an oath and so on. But there's a 
profound and serious jealousy. And you can see it repeating itself at the end of the 14th century. Uh, there is, uh, in the reign of Richard II, uh, there, there are the acts of provisors and primunire, which are designed to stop papal legislation or the citation of papal legislation coming into England and all of this of course receives its magnificent efflorescence in the reign of Henry VIII with the complete rejection of papal authority, the authority of the universal church within England. And what is striking ladies and gentlemen about the reign of Henry VIII is that it is consciously presented, its major forms of advocacy and propaganda are worked in terms what the Americans did was to take the elements of a balanced constitution, the classic one, uh, few, many, in other words, king, lords, and commons. They took them and they progressively and rather hesitantly and with a lot of reservations democratized them. Remember, American democracy is only complete on the eve of the First World War when the Senate itself is made directly elective. Um, we disastrously only democratized one member of that tripartite constitution. And what I would suggest, and interestingly enough, the prime ministerial debates illustrate this point, we need a directly elected prime minister. With a directly, in other words, we need the American constitution. The American constitution is just the English constitution. I mean, it really is. Um, I mean, the powers of an American president are identical to those of an 18th century English king. Um, uh, except, and it's, it's an elective monarchy just like the Pope. Uh, similarly, the, um, I mean, even, it's, it's correct even down to detail. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm half American in many ways and I spend loads of time there. And one of the things that's fascinating is, is when you know, um, Americans start talking about the internal workings of Congress and whatever. You'll get Americans saying, you know, we didn't quite understand it, but there's this person called the Sergeant at Arms, uh, you know, um, who, 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 who runs, runs the lower house. And, and you gently say, well, that's because the English Parliament, for the English House of Commons from the reign of Henry VIII always had a sergeant at arms. So it's even down to detail like that. And the American Constitution works. Ours doesn't. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do you want to ask your second question? Uh, if Greedy. You don't, if you don't Greedy. mind. Uh, very quickly, the militarization of the police. Um, do you think this has been an unfortunate development since 9-11, or it's been a more sinister, more sinister um, coming into the system in a more sinister way for longer than that. I mean, we see pictures, I don't know Andrew Marr's history of Britain, where you saw the, um, the riots in the 80s, um, but there's a lot in the press uh, over the last few years that this has been a lot of legislation brought in and through the back door because mm. of the terrorism. I mean, it was very striking, you know, if you look at photographs of the police in the minor strike, they look laughably amateur. They're sort of, you know, linked like that. Uh, look at them now. I mean, the man who astonishingly was acquitted. He's a paramilitary force, using deliberate force, aggressive force. And I think that this is something we should all be genuine. It doesn't make me feel any more secure. One of my, the most terrifying members of my childhood, memories of my childhood, was going to Paris for the first time at the time of, I think it's a 58 business, and looking at the Palais Bourbon, uh, the, the, the French Assembly building, surrounded by police toting machine guns. I thought, you know, God, thank heavens, I live in a civilized country. Little did I know. Someone else? Over here. Yes. To go back to your answer to the first question, does it follow then that you would abolish the monarchy? No, on the contrary. I think the only real problem with the American Constitution is um, the fact that the president is also head of state. I, 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 and it's increasingly clear that, that this is impossible. And the whole issue of Obama, and what you feel about Obama or Bush, uh, what you feel about Bush, you know, one if you were Democrat, the other if you were Republican, it, it is rending the system apart. On the contrary, I mean, if, if you look at it, the what had happened in this election, in a characteristic fashion, we discovered we actually have a president. Those, I, I, who on earth was advising Brown and, and Cameron? I cannot imagine. But if you have three people given equal time with three equal podia, by definition, you have three candidates for one office, don't you? And it seems to me that if we did this, 
most of the problems of our uh, current political system will be solved. We all seem, though I think it's childish, to aspire to a charismatic leader. You know, this, this kind of, oh, God, you know, he's young, he's handsome. He's, uh, uh, and uh, the, 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 the kind of X-factor view of politics. Well, okay, uh, let's... Uh, and Obama is just as preposterous, um, except have you noticed what a kind of steely brute he's turned into? Now all that soaring rhetoric is gone. Then you just get one of these presidential announcements, this will, this will happen. Um, uh, it, would, it would give you that charismatic element. You could then do what is the obvious next thing. You could get... Uh, it would also eliminate any need for proportional representation, you would have an absolute straightforward vote. Um, you could then do the next thing, which is vital and which the Americans do, and which uh, campaigners in the 18th century wanted to do. You could remove the executive from the legislature. Have you noticed recently we've had a whole series of legal reforms that have been designed to reform things that weren't actually working badly, like abolishing the office of Lord Chancellor? The notion that the Lord Chancellor suffered any serious problems with the combination of the political and the legislature is simply silly and an insult to people like Mackay and all the rest of it. It's a reform with entirely no purpose at all. On the other hand, the combination of the legislature and the executive is catastrophic. It's catastrophic in every way. It means Parliament doesn't do its task of legislating properly or holding the executive to account. It also means that our executive is chosen from the kind of gene pool that would be hard pushed to run a medium-sized company. <laughs> Isn't that true? I mean, how many MPs would you appoint as a headmaster? I mean, quite seriously. Um, uh, and, and so I, I think, you know, that, that's the only way we're going to start to get that right. But, but, and also, this notion that the English have never had written constitutions, preposterous. Magna Carta is arguably the earliest. 1688-89 directly flows into the American Constitution. The whole debates of the petition of right practically define um, uh, the, the, the debates uh, surround uh, uh, life, liberty, and property, which the Americans hastily, because property doesn't sound quite so good, they originally had life, liberty, and property, and they hastily amend it to the pursuit of happens with catastrophic consequences you know, in, in terms of their mental health, but never mind. Um, <laughs> my, can, can, sorry, microphone. The acoustics really are dreadful. They are dreadful, yeah. Speaking up loudly and bravely. Brazenly, I think, is the word. <laughs> <laughs> are there any other reforms you would recommend, radical reforms you'd recommend to English law? To English law, um, well, I suppose in some way they're rather backwards ones. Um, I, I, I think we need a process of radical simplification. Law has got grotesquely complex um, in both um, its substance uh, and its methods of enforcement. Um, it has become seen as, forgive me, uh, the uh, possession of a professional and grossly overpaid elite uh, prof professional privilege and grossly overpaid elite, it's, it's alien. Now, how one goes about that, God alone knows. But I think, I think if we actually began, the, the, the obvious point in which it seems to me that we should be starting is with Parliament. That's one thing that we all recognise really is broken and we could begin to fix um, and we could begin to do something with. And again, you see, I, I tend to wax lyrical on this subject and mist comes uh, in, into my eyes and little tears trickle. Um, yesterday, I was in my little town in New England, uh, not in New England, but in a place that looks like New England, Chestertown in Maryland. And what is very, it's three and a half thousand people. What is very striking about that is the sense that law is still local and still belongs. Obviously, the sheriff is an elected officer. The courthouse is where the courthouse has been unbuilt, unrebuilt, not with gla not with glazed screens, you know, not, not Richard Rogers having done something wonderful or horrible to it, in the really pretty early 18th century building. Um, next to it is a quite wonderful courthouse row. They're the little, they're, they're now rather beautiful shacks, but they were originally the, 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 the attorney's shacks going along there, each little law office, again there since about 1780. And it's there, it's yours. Now, there are other sides of that which are not quite so good, though actually, if you're a resident, they're very good. Let me tell you my little favourite Chestertown story. It was when we were sort of really new arrived and we'd just got the house, 
um, and James, my partner, was dry. We, we were in a terrible hurry. And there's a very pretty town square, which quite unnecessarily has got a one-way system. So we did the obvious thing, look round, nobody there at all. We go down here. It was then like a scene out of the Keystone Cops from absolutely nowhere, two very ancient 60s American automobiles, you know, rusting white with vast fins that are all we can afford as police cars appeared from the sea. Well, guns weren't actually pointed at us, but it felt like it. James blethered, I thought this is going to be a disaster. So I pulled my very best English. I'm terribly sorry, officer, you know, but we're foreign. At which point, fine. You know. um, uh, two hours later, I was rung by my real tour, and she said, uh, I gather you had a brush with the police. 